You are not in a place. You are a place. Well, you're in a place too that was meant to be dramatic. Reading a single line from Manly P. Hall fucked me up pretty good when I was younger. He said, we are the gods of atoms that make up ourselves, but we are also the atoms of the gods that make up the universe. When you find yourself in isolation, do you find yourself to be alone? Is it possible to imagine that what you consider to be void is alive and aware of you? You are not just a player in your environment. There is a community within you that makes you tick. You are an environment for this community. The environment you are in is also a player in a much bigger unseen environment. Consider the bacteria in your guts that are busy breaking down the food that you have eaten. They are not aware of your person as the figure that it is, but you are aware of them. Below that, we have the molecules that consider the bacteria to be their environment. Below that are the proteins, then atoms, then electrons, then quarks, and so on and on and on and on, until you eventually get to the nothingness of pure consciousness that provides all of it. So in a way, you are an entire universe. People seem to assume that the buck stops there, with them as the largest and most sentient portion of all these realities. This is very silly and extremely nearsighted. In the same way that the bacteria cannot see or even imagine us, we cannot see or imagine upwards into dimensions above our reality. We have biological senses specifically developed for the survival of this thin layer of reality. We have not yet developed the perceptive attributes to perceive the other layers of realities without certain tools and methods. If you pay close enough attention, there are even conflicting personalities within a single person's psyche. When Carl Jung went into his own head, deliberately into madness, he was astonished to find characters with greatly different views from his own, or what he thought was his own. We are able to discover that our persona and belief systems might not be our own, but in fact, a running program set into place by our world. The way we think, speak, and act consciously is simply the byproduct of many years of cultural dictation. When the subconscious mind, which is connected to a much higher reality, surfaces itself in our behavior, we will deem this to be events happening to us. Our deeper mind has a stranglehold over our behavior and we cannot see it any more than we can taste our own tongue. If you are able to tap into that portion of the mind, you can then start to analyze how it makes you tick. This is difficult because there are people in there who are not you, or at least ones that you assumed were not you, but in fact are portions of you that you just don't like. Ironically, we must fully accept and understand them in order to integrate them into the whole. I mean, even the earth has to do this with mosquitoes, if you think about it. Nobody likes skeeters, but earth is making it work for her. So as the guy head of your own universe, you prefer all of the community leader roles. But we are mechanisms of the so-called godhead of many names, and when we do well to work with the same flow that our biology does for us, we will in turn be preserving the health of a higher and more sentient being. As I have said, to serve man is to serve God. These unseen beings and realities are also not where the buck stops, the same way that that we will keep finding smaller and smaller things than atoms, thus universes within universes, we will also find that what we consider to be higher powers are also cogs in the machine of an entirely greater realm. When you find yourself isolated, consider the magnitude of what is living, working, and playing with and without. Know that by simply existing, you both have a large and small portion of a many-layered and unimaginably dynamic reality. We have no choice but to be a cog in this universe, and so the old phrase goes, as above, so below, as within, so without. classic paradoxal phrase from Edadorpa reads, never less alone than when alone. When we think of stories about gods and angels coming down from heaven, or even alien abduction cases, 
I sometimes think of a biologist reaching into a petri dish to study microbes, or an oceanographer interacting with fish. There is a penetrator of sentience into the familiar form of the lower worlds for differing reasons. Reasons that these lower forms are not capable of comprehending. As your consciousness grows by feeding its adversity, your field of vision also grows, thus expands into spaces of greater perceivable insights. The abrasive place that a conscious form is set to endure, or currently adoring, corresponds to the places of the above and the below. Above and below, with and without, and a plethora of other dimensions that we have not conceived of yet. The discharge of energy resulting from the survival rituals practiced by the eye feeds itself that very energy, thus becoming it once again. They say you are what you eat. When this consumption of energy loops into itself, it perpetuates its state of expression into an unstagnant level within that space. Jeez, this, this whole video is just gonna seem like word soup. Sorry, but words invented for regular reality have trouble with other realities, so uh, bear with me. By expanding the awareness of yourself as a place, you can grow that bubble of sentience outwardly, expanding into the inevitable path. A path that typically takes a catastrophe to realize even exists. We have shortcuts in the way of spiritual alchemy though, eventually emerging into other bubbles of sentience, higher bubbles of sentience, worlds that exist outside of our experiential capabilities that could be met with and allowed to amalgamate with our current level of place, making us more whole, physically and mentally, above and below. We can pierce into the higher worlds of place and person. These are faster frequencies of vibration that contain the information that gives birth to realities, a higher bandwidth, so to speak, of reality, and a wider set of tools for perception. But why would higher and lower worlds both exist in the first place? Is there a cause of separation outside of our place of understanding that causes rifts in once prior unified realms and into these deistic hierarchies? Why are there aboves and belows in the first place? Well, when you hit your tennis ball over the net to the other side of the court, I am assuming that you're hoping to get it back. Before we can pierce into this bitch and take a look-see, first we have to know that we are the mystery to be looked at. You are the enigma, and that's it. Nothing came before you, and nothing will come after. So, uh, tag bitch, you're it. Let's get our heads around this real quick. Imagine a single point of consciousness unaccompanied by anything, just a non-dimensional point surrounded not even by void. Movement, size, and direction cannot exist because there is nothing else to have those concepts in relation to. This single point of awareness has thoughts and thus can reflect upon itself so now in a way there are two positions thought and no thought or nous and prima materia now that there are two we have distance and what is possible for movement and direction. Imagine this thing moves and conducts these simple activities again, spreading out, creating the concept of space and time. Well, now we have size and speed. As these activities continue exciting what was once seemingly nothing, the activities become more and more complex as they fractal out in all directions, creating dimensions and purpose of their own will. Spatial dimensions that we can't perceive and purpose that we are not aware of yet. As this goes on, certain laws of nature take place according to the mind of these fractals, including would be our particular known laws of physics and many others that we cannot imagine. Think of these fractals like the tentacles of an octopus. Each has its own brain and unique thoughts, but is still connected to a main source. Out of this expanding mind of thought forms come very many levels of reality. Then, of course, many levels of life and intelligence that learn and consume themselves in order to build themselves. The complexity continues on and on, and this process does not have a stopping point, for the process simply is to be the process. It has no goal except for improvement, creating pockets of order from 
this vast chaos. Language, tools, currency, buildings, all forms of society come into existence, always still from the previous single dot of consciousness. Think of all dogs, big and small. They came from wolves. And uh, after we intervened, of course, basically your great aunt's labradoodle is only so many generations fallen from these giant strategic cold-blooded hunters that we call wolves. Uh, De-evolution is real, y'all. And then there is you. For whatever reason, you feel as if you are separate from all of this. You feel like you are looking at the process from the outside. The fact of the matter is that you are that single dot and you are the process at large from the very beginning to the end. And we have forgotten. One might go into many theories on the mysteries of how we are born with amnesia, but no one seems to have an answer locked down. It seems, however, that we can realize or remember this origin of ourselves at any time, but are incredibly distracted by the circus of noise around us based on culture, which too is also the process. You are the primordial first cause still going. And if you disagree with that, well, that disagreement is also just part of the process. And you look like a raindrop pretending that you ain't water. If you stop Stop moving up in the process, then you might just be trapped in the ice cube. Something that is fact yet very hard to conceive is that you are the only one who experiences your reality. And that entire reality is rendered in the dark inside of your skull. Your eyes do not see, your brain does. Eyes are merely a lens, not the recording device, the memory center, or even the viewer. Your ears do not hear, your brain does that as well. The ears are simply a microphone, not the software, the listener, or the speaker. Everything you have ever seen was seen in the occipital lobe of your own head. Everything you have ever heard was heard in the temporal lobe within your own head. Even all the things you can touch are made aware to you by a electrical signals triggered and sent from your nervous system and into the brain, where you can then go ahead and experience it. In this way, it is worth considering that everything is actually just you. What you consider to be not you is indeed just your own consciousness, forming a conceptual barrier. If you consider yourself to be outside of this concept, then even that notion itself too is just part of the concept. In the world of quantum physics, we have learned that atoms do not seem to come into hard material form until they are perceived. Until then, they are considered a superposition or a cloud of possibility. It seems that matter is just projected consciousness as much as ideas or language are. Your world is projected, and the phrase, life is what you make of it, comes to mind. But either way, it is us who take the patterns of a holographic field and buffer it into tangible worlds and I mean, what a mind fuck, right? By the way, the holographic universe thing and simulation theory are two completely different things, and uh, that episode is in the works. The Tibetan Book of the Dead has many instructions for what to do after death, quite literally. Well, uh, literally, but with an allegory attached. I mean, the book still has to be written in a language that we can understand, despite talking about things that we cannot see or perceive, thus we don't have words for. But after you die, it is said that you are confronted by demonic beings called Mara. It is instructed that you are to remember and know that they are you, indeed just projections of yourself. And just by doing so, you are free from them and uh, apparently free from everything at that point. This seems like it might also serve as a parallel for this life as well. When asked what the true name of God is, Jesus responded, I am that I am. I am means God in its unimaginable format, and that I am means what is being done. In this case, perhaps he was getting the party lit with red merlot and psilocybin. By the way, if you're ever at a fancy dinner party and they ask you what you want to drink, I encourage anyone to pronounce it merlot. And I promise you will be just the life of the party from that moment on. And no, I am not being sarcastic. There is nothing people love more than correcting others. And this is the definition of irony.
There is no sensor of the universe, any more than we can find the sensor on the surface of a ball. To have a sensor requires a conscious format to realize a sensor of being. So reality is subjective to the viewer and not objective on its own merit. And well, uh, this is good news for everyone. Human is a verb. This is why we call it human being. It is something the universe does. Atoms are like a whirlpool, never the same water, but maintaining the same form. So the universe is conscious simply because we are. It seems that all human beings are a god fetus, like the amalgamation of all human thought seems to be a fetus of God. That makes the earth sort of a 5D womb. We are gods that have forgotten that we are. This is where that I am comes in. No, it hasn't. Oh, this is the first time that who threw up, Paul? No. Pickles. Dr. Biggles threw up? To be careful of what we eat. Okay? Yeah, well, he had a little bit of Taco Bell yesterday. Yeah, no. <laughs> Don't give him stuff like that. It was just the cheese. No, it doesn't matter. Please don't do that. Okay. Only no. cat food and, and, uh, and tuna. And milk sometimes. Existence may have stillness, but reality is an oscillation. Dancing patterns busy doing the process. It is void and all at the same time. We pick from both. By being alive, we are interpreting that oscillation. It is a language for us. We get to pick what it says, what it means, and we do this little ditty every day. If a person refuses to partake in this interpretation, well, that refusal is also just another form of interpretation. We should also choose to take advantage of this gift, even though we don't know why. And sometimes it is difficult. It being difficult and not knowing why simultaneously is downright treacherous, I realize. But we keep going and we keep dancing. The song will make sense when we are ready for it to. Until then, it smiles and winks at us like a pompous bitch in an ivory tower. Rude. That pattern is made of laughter, by the way a cosmic giggle, so to speak. And why not? Hindus called the active creation of the universe the Leela, or game. So if it is true that this reality is a joke, well, the universe certainly caught it, so maybe we should too. Coming from a viewpoint of hermetics, anxiety and laughter are actually the same thing, just separated by poles. So the Brahma sneaks up on itself in this cosmic game of hide and seek. It says, boo. And for that sudden jerk of anxiety that is necessary for balance, and then it chooses laughter directly afterwards. Because the jump scare was funny. And this is a game, a play, a dance, and maybe a test. I don't know. The phrase, everything is one, is oversaid, and we even act as if we believe it. But understanding this notion, however, is another story. Because what if you made it all up? every bit of it, the whole of everything, all the way back to the so-called Big Bang. You thought it all up. You dreamt it. You did. It's you. But we gotta ask, does this make me alone in the universe or does it make us finally whole? I have a hunch that, like everything else, it is up to the viewer to decide. Not the YouTube viewer, I mean each and every one of us. You, you get it. And strange that I, I really can't say any more than that without painting the notion with ideas that distract us from it. Basically, actions can be taken with a foresight instead of a hindsight, which of course is always 2020. But with foresight, some of us might need glasses, and uh, and that's okay. Oh, speaking of which, there we go. Yeah. Do I look like I know what I'm talking about now? How can we act differently knowing that everything ever conceived is your perpetual conscious awareness oscillating in this cycle? Albert Einstein once said, the soul given to each of us is moved by the same living spirit that moves the universe. And weird that if you're a genius, you can say shit like that. But if you build skyscrapers, then you're a crazy person. Yeah, I I'm jealous. I'll be jelly all I want.
It was MJ Hawking who said, the world around us is a magnificent illusion. It appears to us as real because we are as much a part of the illusion as everything else. In fact, it is we who are the master magicians as it is we who are creators of the illusion. Again, something that you can say if you're brilliant, but if you make a sandwich in the Costco cart because you don't want to shop hungry, then you don't get the privilege of shopping there anymore, I guess. Single dads never shop hungry. The fact remains that absolute knowledge is absolutely free and waiting for you to discover it, to deserve it. You are already it, as the ancients and masters hinted at. Now it's time to realize it. But to realize it, we have to stop carrying all the weight that comes with the logic needed to survive. That oftentimes gets very heavy on our back. But how do we get a grip, or better phrased, how do we lose our grip and let go? We are, in fact, addicted to idealism all of us. Everything that can be made ideal is certainly projected from within. From within, we paint our reality on the outside. It seems to be that simple, but the discipline is the sacrifice here. There is within us and all living things DNA. That is very much a language that tells our material self when and how and what to form. But the why to form part, I haven't yet gotten that coded memo. We have discussed that 98% of our DNA is said to be junk. But why would nature, as finely tuned as it is, waste so much time and effort by having so much extra information encoded in our blood? Nature does not seem to create extra shit for no reason. Why would anything extra reside within the programming of the human genome? In previous videos, we learned about the possible syntax errors in the code of of reality through our creation myths and you know Gnostic lore, we started to get a hint about there being forces beyond our comprehension. Forces that seem to want to study the biology and reproductive system of living creatures here on Earth. And I wonder if this correlates. Is there a chance that long, long ago, human beings were fully awake in the usage of their entire DNA? Is there a chance that this DNA was somehow flipped off, like a switch for reasons that can only be speculated upon? If so, would that lend credence to the idea that the Earth is a form of school to be graduated? or? perhaps a pharmacologic project, perhaps a cattle ranch of, of resource to be thrown away after using. These books are scary, y'all. But in 2021, it was found that more than 10% of our genome consists of nonsensical codes of genetic material that loop on repeat for unknown reasons. This DNA has been referred to as satellite DNA because they do not, in fact, seem to encode any proteins. So many scientists have turned to calling this repeating process genomic junk. Why wouldn't we have simply evolved out of that process if it no longer serves us then? Kind of like whatever organ it is that we don't use anymore. Uh, what's that organ? Uh, the, uh, the brain, I think it's called. Just like our appendix, uh, we <laughs> it, it must have once served a purpose. As this repeating loop insists on continuing on within our code of DNA language, yet we continue to ignore it. What if we didn't? What if it is the cheat code of the transition from survival mode to creative mode that we can easily tap into? After all, it seems to be on repeat as if to catch our attention. Either way, the idea that a portion of our DNA has been turned off by external forces is a disturbing one to say the least. Looking at ancient architecture compared to what we build now seems to reflect this possibility. The ancient Egyptians credited Thoth, the Atlantean, for their brilliance. And ancient Greece, they credit the Egyptians. And now you have philosophers today crediting the, the Greek. It was known to Plato that the ancient high priests of Egypt considered the Greek to be children in knowledge despite their comfortable living. And 
From there, some kind of de-evolution has taken place, very much like our ways, viewpoints, and living standards, choosing comfort over discomfort. Very much like our architecture, we have fallen into boxes like cookie cutter cubes. Our mathematics are no longer spiritual and inclined through sacred geometry. We know that the ancients knew something that we do not know today, but is this our fault though? If you ask me, I wouldn't be surprised if we did this to ourselves once upon a time through some kind of equivalent to water fluoridation or aluminum in the air type of thing. But I still can't shake the haunting feeling that it came from somewhere outside of our control, outside of our understanding, and, and maybe even outside of our reality altogether. Both within and without, the structure that we once had, well, it, it's no longer there, and it's been replaced with a black cube. The Master Mason considers architecture to be equivalent with our character. He treats himself, that is to say his words, thoughts, and habits in general, to be likened to the building of a temple. This is why we say, I am the temple, which of course slid progressively into my body is my temple because everything is super literal and material now. But when we pay attention to ourselves the same way that we would when doing precision work like building a temple or a work of art, we find that the building of our character follows the same suit as the architecture that is an allegory for it. In the field of stonemasonry, which is dwindled quite a bit. It was what the mason removed from the stone that made it great and not what he added to it. This is a sure connection of character philosophy between the masons and the Zen masters. You take away the excess to find the work of art, but to drive a chisel into ourselves, metaphorically speaking even, is of course uh, it can be very painful, and this certainly takes discipline. We have to remember that we are the godhead of this location, this place that we call us. In the same way that we depend on the little guys uh, within us to keep the clock ticking, they too depend on us to watch over them. We are the shepherd of this neighborhood of little rascals. Little rascals that are oftentimes trying to sneak out of bounds, both biologically and psychologically. For example, the gut bacteria, believe it or not, controls what foods we crave. And guess what kind of foods they get addicted to real quick. A shepherd of this situation will override the signals sent up from the, you call them prayers of desire, if you will, from these little boogers and, and it will keep them in check. Our job is to keep them in check. And psychologically, we are going to have cravings as well. We all know how that goes. It is different for everyone. But to be the shepherd of this situation is not much different from the food. We just have to recognize what the people of our body-mind universe are up to and try not to let them slip us up. Taking back to our axiom, as above, so below, it works here as well. The body and mind are connected. It can lift the other up or drag it down sometimes both at once. For example, a person could feel physically ill, but upon hearing good news, all of a sudden becomes not lethargic. The same goes for adrenaline. Our mind can very easily override the signals of the pain body. And the same goes the opposite direction of, as well. If we are in a depressed or anxious mood, a surge of good energy to the body can alleviate that. We often turn to quick fixes like drugs for that process to take place. And uh, I know I am guilty, but the truest way, like the stonemason who subtracts instead of adds, will shed parts of himself and let them burn in this alchemical fire instead of adding stimuli to the pain body for an instant relief. But nevertheless, all of the great mysteries really boil down to who we are as a self with a capital S. This is the self that transcends our short time here in this life. In her book, God Man, Inez Perry writes this. 
A child brought to its mother a piece of ice and asked, what is this? The mother answered, it is ice. The child asked, what is there in ice? The mother answered, there is water in the ice. The child desired to find the water in the ice and it procured a hammer, pounded the piece of ice into little bits and the warm air soon changed all the ice into water. The child was grievously disappointed for the ice that the child supposed contained water had disappeared. And the child said, where is the ice that contained this water? The mother was compelled by the child's persistent questions to say, ice is all water. There is no such thing as ice. That which we call ice is crystallized or frozen water. The child understood. A student brought to his teacher some water and asked, what is water? What does it contain? The teacher answered, water contains oxygen and hydrogen, and then explained how the two gases might be separated and set free by heat. The student boiled the water until all of the molecules of oxygen and hydrogen had been set free, but he was surprised to find that all of the water had disappeared. Then the student asked of the teacher, where is the water that held the gases that have escaped? The teacher, compelled by the student's persistent questions to answer, water itself is the product of oxygen and hydrogen. Water does not contain anything other than these gases. In reality, there is no such substances or fluid as water. That which we name water is a rate of motion set into operation by the union of two parts of hydrogen and one part of oxygen. And of course, the phenomenon disappears when the union of the gases is broken. The student understood. A devout scientist presented himself before God and said, Lord, what are these gases men call oxygen and hydrogen? The Lord answered and said, they are molecules in the blood and body of the universe. Then spake the scientist, spake, then spake the scientist, Lord, wilt thou tell me of the kind of molecules that compose thy blood and thy body? It's hard to kind of speak in this old English. The Lord replied, the same molecules, gases, or principles compose my body and blood, for I and the universe are one and the same. Once again, the scientist said, my Lord, may I ask then, what is the spirit and what is matter? And thus the Lord answered, as ice and water are one, and the gases and water are one, so is spirit and matter one. The different phases and manifestations cognized by man in the molecules of my body, that is, the universe, are caused by the word. Thus they are my thoughts clothed with form. Now the scientist felt bold, being redeemed from fear, and asked, is my blood then identical with thy blood in composition and divine essence? And the Lord said, yea, thou art one with the Father. The scientist now understood and said, Said, now mine eyes are opened, and I perceive that when I eat, I partake of thy body. When I drink, I drink of thy blood. And when I breathe, I breathe thy spirits. So called matter is pure intelligence and nothing else, because there is not anything else. Pure intelligence cannot progress or become better. There is nothing but intelligence, omnipresence, omnipotence, omniscience must mean intelligence. Therefore, these terms are all included in the word. The above written words are intended to express, namely, the word it. I stands for all, the eternal I, and T stands for operation, manifestation, vibration, action, or motion. The I in the motion is T, or crossification. We say it rains, or it is cold, or it is all right. What do we mean by it? It does not progress, it does not need to. It forever manifests, operates, differentiates, and presents different aspects or viewpoints of itself. But these different phases are neither good, better, nor best, neither bad nor worse, simply different shades and colorings of the one and only intelligence. And uh, that breakdown of the word it being I and T kind of reminds us of what Jesus said when he spoke, I am that I am. This kind of gnosis is where we turn away from hard science temporarily and take a look at what myth has to teach us here in this life. People make the mistake of thinking that the allegory that comes with mythology comes from a place of ignorance on behalf of the speaker. 
because the double meanings are meant to depict something that we can't quite understand in this uh, current mindset. But this is a fallacy. These double meanings are instead for the receiver, the listener of the myth. The allegory is taking that step on behalf of the listener thus the future generations. And these myths are not written by single men. They are written by mankind as a whole. Mythology works as an unerasable history, a history of man's mind. Mythology is the only unburnable book. The teachings of mythology are second nature to us without any effort because we are a product of it, way more than it is a product of us. Mythology is all around you and obvious, but it is also that weird hidden space in the attic that is locked by a padlock and, and it, it sparks our curiosity. When we have thoughts about how temporary our time is here in this life, one might have a sense of dread, but there are those who see it with delight and opportunity having felt lucky to have experienced something in the first place. Kurt Vonnegut writes this in The Last Rites of the Bokanonist Faith. God made mud. God got lonesome. So God said to some of the mud, sit up. And I was some of the mud that got to sit up and look around. Lucky me, lucky mud. I got so much and most mud got so little. Thank you for the honor. Now mud lies down again and goes to sleep. What memories for mud to have? What interesting other kinds of sitting up mud I met? I loved everything I saw. Good night. Quite the bittersweet. The great mysteries are something timeless and much bigger than we can imagine while existing as this pinpoint of consciousness right now. This is scary as hell but still requires being accepted and absorbed because uh, mud sat up only for a moment. And in that moment, it got to experience the greatest mystery of all, itself. The primate invents a tool that plunge them into flesh and war like sharks in the gene Manipulate those who 